Hey guys, Cody B here bringing you a message from God's Word. We will begin in Luke 13, beginning in verse 1. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 17. We're continuing our study of the life of Christ by looking at the, the book of Luke. And we'll begin now in verse 1. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans who blood Pilate was mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think... These Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Were those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish, beginning in this passage of Scripture in, in chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Jesus is asked a question, and it seems, certainly asked a question, but it just seems like to me that they were discussing just everyday life. You know what I'm saying? It sounds like they were just talking about just regular present day events and as they were discussing it obviously with Jesus Christ he takes it and turns it into some spiritual maybe there was a question that went along with the conversation about how evil these Galileans must have been or how or how these Galileans must have done something so horrible and and Jesus and we don't actually have what was discussed there if that was a question they brought up or or Jesus uh, switched to this passage of scripture but Jesus asked them the question he says look do you think that those individuals were worse than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? And maybe I need to explain what it means to have your blood mingled with sacrifices. That essentially what was taking place was these individuals were sacrificing and blood, and, and excuse me, and Pilate had them killed while they were sacrificing and their their blood got mingled with the sacrificial blood that was upon the altar and it was a horrible tragedy that took place. Jesus says that because they suffered this horrible tragedy, do you think they're worse? Jesus says, I, I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He then brings up a, a tower in Siloam that, that fell and killed some 18 people. And he said, look, do you think that those individuals were worse or more evil than all those who live in the city of Jerusalem. He's asking the question, he says, look, because they suffered this tragedy, this, this horrible accident that took place, do you think they were more evil? Do you think they were bad? Do you think they had done some horrendous atrocity that they deserve this and that this might be a punishment because of something they had done or some way they were living? And Jesus answers the question and says, I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. There's a few things we can take from this. And the first thing I always take from this was, was Jesus was uh, reminding all of us that we are all sinners. And that we should all be concerned with our own souls with our own salvation with our own eternal destiny he he indicates this text he says look these were just accidents this is a horrible tragedy the tower was a was an accident pilot you know killing the individuals that were that were sacrificing was a horrible tragedy but they weren't worse than any of us We're all sin. We're all sinners. We all sin. We all make mistakes and have made mistakes. And, and so many people live in their mistakes. And Jesus tells us we have to walk away from the way we live and turn toward God's word. The other thing I always take from this is, is is the idea that when tragedy does take place so many people ask like like the pandemic 
Uh, I, I think I talked about this before recently, and I'm not going to go too much into it. We're looking at another passage of Scripture, but the same quote comes up, the same event comes up in another gospel, and, and uh, I, you know, people were looking at the pandemic, and they were looking at the disease and saying, was it from God, or was it from Satan? Some preachers and some people were saying, you know, he's, he's trying to, he's punishing us for, for what we've done, he's, we've done something horrible, and I, you know, keep the same point I made back then, <laughs> nobody actually knows, you know? It was just a horrible tragedy, and I feel like so many people were trying to make something out of it, and we have no idea if it was from God, or if it was from Satan, or if he was punishing us, or if he was rerouting us back toward him, or if it's just a horrible tragedy that had no other meaning. And we're not meant to know all these secrets and all these things, but Jesus tells us what we must be most concerned with, that if we don't repent, we will all likewise perish. If we don't change, we will all suffer. He's saying, look, don't worry about how all these other people are, well, not how they're suffering, but don't worry about how their endings are going to take place. Make sure your own life is right first. Listen to what he says, continuing on in verse 6 and following. He told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit of it and found none, and said to the vine dresser, Look, for these three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he, the vine dresser, answered him, said, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure, some versions probably say fertilizer, verse 9, then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. He tells the parable of something that we see every single day. I mean, how many of us have planted tomato plants before and nothing came... The, the plant grew and it was green, but no no tomatoes came forth. Well, in this passage of scripture, he's talking about a fig tree. And the landowner came to get fruit from this fig tree. He wanted his figs, and he approached the fig tree, and there was no figs on it. And the landowner said to the vine dresser, to the gardener, he said, Look, for three years this thing has done nothing. It's produced nothing. It's given us nothing. Let's cut it down. Let's get rid of it. Let's throw it to the fire. And the vine dresser, the gardener says, no. Give me one more year. Let me, let me dig up around it. Let me fertilize it. Let me put manure in it. Let me do some, give it some care. And then if it doesn't produce, we will get rid of it. The main point I always get from this parable and I always attach it to what he says in verses 1 through 5 with the unless you repent you will all likewise perish as he's telling us he says look unless we change we will be plucked up and we will be thrown into the fire we will be cut down it's time for us to look at our life and I'm just going to say use the word he uses here in the text okay and put fertilizer on it Give it care. Give it love. Apply God's word to our life so that we will produce fruit. Fruit that is good. Fruit that is righteous. Fruit that is pleasing to God. It's time to take care of ourselves. Take care of our souls. And live the way he would have us live. It's time to repent. Or we will all likewise perish. We'll end up like the fig tree. We will be cut down and we will be cast out. So what will you do? Will we continue to live the life we have lived of sin and suffering and tragedy? Or will we take God's word 
and implant it into the ground, the hardness of our hearts so that we can produce fruit and so that we can change and live for him. Continuing on now, we're going to look at verses 10 through 17. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She bent over double and could not straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. In this passage of Scripture, Jesus performs a miracle. He's in the synagogue. He's teaching these parables. He's teaching these ideas. And he looks up, and he sees a woman. The Bible says that she was bent over double, and she had been that way for 18 years. The Bible also tells us, that this was because of a spirit that had come upon here, and we'll, we'll see later an evil spirit, a demonic spirit, as, as it were. And he's sitting in the synagogue teaching and preaching, and he sees her, and he calls her over, and, and he gives her and, and says that she is freed from her disability, and she stands upright. She glorifies God. She praises Him. It's a beautiful moment. It's a show, it's, it's a sign of Jesus' care and his love and his uh, compassion that he has for other people. You know, this passage of scripture, you know, there are many people who come to Jesus to be healed. Hey, you can heal me. You're Jesus of, the, of, of Nazareth. You can heal me, Lord, please heal me. And that doesn't seem to be the case here. It doesn't seem like she comes to him. But it seems like he calls her to him because of his love and compassion and care. Heals her. She celebrates. And it would be a beautiful thing if the text ended right there and we didn't have what we have in verses 14 through 17 instead it just jumped through for to straight to verse 18. But no. Jesus has to make another point. Listen to what happens in verse 14 the following. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. He looks at his congregation. He looks at the people in the synagogue and says, there are six, day, six days in which you should be healed, and you should come those days, and Jesus can heal you on those days. Don't come on the Sabbath. We're supposed to rest. And the Lord answered, that's Jesus. You hypocrites. Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox and his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? The ruler of the synagogue, the leader, the elder, the preacher, whatever you want to say, the guy who was in charge of this particular synagogue stood up and said, Don't come here on the seventh day to be healed. This is a day of rest. And Jesus said, you hypocrite. You hypocrite. You water your own animals on this day. You take them, you untie them, you walk them to the well, you walk them to the water. You feed them on this day is watering your animal, untying it and leading it and watering it and feeding it and tying it back. Is that, does that work? You know, there's another passage of scripture where he says, you know, if your ox fell into a hole, would you not get it out? Verse 16, And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond, on the Sabbath day, he says, look, you take care of your animals on the Sabbath day. You take care of your ox. You take care of your 
donkey, you give it food, you give it water, you lead it, you tie it back up, you untie it, you tie it back up. How much more important is it for us to take care of this daughter of Abraham? How much more important is it us for to, to take care of this soul whom, whom Satan has tormented? It goes back to what we said a few weeks ago about them ignoring the weightier provisions of the law. They made the sacrifices and the rituals more important than people. They missed out. Verse 17, as he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. And they should have been. And all the people rejoiced in all the glorious things that were done by him. May God bless, and I hope you have a wonderful day.